know that Professor Cahill needs no introduction um, and that you're all here. Do we have a... Oh, thank you. So welcome to the Symposium on Perspective Painting in Late Imperial China in honor of Professor Jim Cahill. Um, I know that Professor Cahill needs no introduction to this audience and um, that we're all here because of our tremendous admiration and devotion to his work. Um, as, as you know, he's the very, the very distinguished um, emeritus professor in Chinese art at, at Berkeley. Um, we have a couple of speakers who've come from far and wide to speak in honor of Professor Cahill today. Um, Nancy Berliner, curator of Chinese art at the Museum of Fine Arts. Um, Richard Vinograd, who's the Christensen Fund Professor in Asian Art at Stanford. And Eugene Wong, who's the Ab Abby Eldridge Rockefeller um, Professor of Asian Art at Harvard University. Um, but before we begin with Eugene, um, we actually have a surprise for you. Um, Professor Cahill has some remarks that he would like to share. Okay. Uh, hello. This, I am indeed very honored to be the subject, I mean, the honoree of a symposium of this. With, uh, with people of this stature uh, giving their time and scholarly energy to preparing papers and a very distinguished group of, 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 of in the audience. I won't start naming them, but uh, anyway, yes, far away people like Soren Nitgren and Christopher Underberg. And anyway, uh, now I asked, um, I asked Pat for a few, just a few minutes at the very beginning just to introduce something to you that I recently came to my own attention, uh, and it's not unrelated to the subject of the symposium, so I kind of mus muscled in here to just take a very, very brief time to show you these things. What's on the screen, it, uh, it's, a, it's a new chapter in a long story. It starts back in mm, 1940s when the dealer Walter Hochstetter showed me uh, a, an album of 20 leaves painted in 1626 by the uh, by John Hong, uh, and, our, and uh, representing the Zhur Garden, a garden uh, in the uh, Suzhou region. And um, Hochstetter had the bad habit of breaking up things and selling parts of them to different places. And we ended up with eight leaves and, in a, a European collection and 12 in US collections and so on. Um, anyway, this is the first leaf of it, and it's a bird's eye view. Uh, interestingly, uh, John Hong does not does not do the bird's eye view of the Chinese manner, sort of map-like, uh, laid out schematic. He as if it was really up there in the air, which is quite amazing. And the whole album is that way, so I'll show up. Next, please. Next uh, image. Yes. He might have been inspired by European pictures that were available to be seen in China by this time. This is one of them. I have discussed this in various places, so I won't do it all again. But. Um, he could have been inspired by this, but basically it was a no idea. Next, please. Um, now, uh, I, the, the, we had uh, some leaves in that album and uh, our exhibition uh, of late Ming paintings that I organized with a group of extraordinary group of students, Pat Berger among them, in the late 60s. And then it was shown in 71, The Restless Landscape. And anyway, then, but at that time I hadn't yet uh, really figured out what was going on in this album. However, okay, year, years passed and I spent a lot more time with Zhang Ho. And eventually, 1996, LACMA, that's how know it's kind of Museum of Art, has an exhibition which they bring together all the leaves of this album. The ones in, uh, in Germany, uh, the, at the Berlin Museum, and also the ones here. They, by that time, they had been divided into four parts, uh, uh, the ones in the States. I myself had owned four of them that I got in trade with Hochstetter. And I sold them cheap to Bachma so they could have the, the whole bunch and somebody else could do it. Anyway, now they're just in two places. But at any rate, uh, now I had a chance to figure out what more what John Hong was up to. And it's an amazing thing is that he uh, has, uh, paints the remaining leaves as though he are somehow stationing himself at a certain point sometimes way up in the air where he couldn't be in reality, looking down at the garden. And he manages to lock together all the parts of the 
garden spatially, each leaf containing things that are also to be seen in the others, in such a way that, as I wrote down, one could completely re re uh, re re reproduce uh, the garden uh, from just the visual information that John Willing provides. And uh, this shows all for all the different leaves and where you just pick, please. And uh, then uh, the, the young man here is a man named Huang Xiao, and he wrote me from Beida, Peking University, uh, a couple of years ago, I guess it was, to say that he and his professor had found the literary writings, this a rare single copy in the Beijing Library, literary writings of the man who owned the Jerk Garden with an essay on it and a lot of information on it. So anyway, to make the long story short, uh, I ended up getting him to work with me on a book on Chinese paintings of gardens, which was published and sold, and now it's in the second printing, very successful. I wish we could get it into English. Anyway, here he is. Next, please. Uh, now, what is amazing is that now uh, he has just sent me uh, pictures. This is one of them. Uh, a, a garden designer down in uh, in Changzhou who read our book was so inspired by the idea that he wants to really recreate the Jur Garden. Uh, I don't know where he'll do it or where he'll find the space or the things. But meanwhile, since he can't do it in real space, he does it in what is it, cyberspace or anyway, whatever it is, uh, and, has, and has created these images in which you can see the jerk garden as if you were there. And these are artificial images he made. Next, please. Yes, here is the, here's the, here, here we are looking across the, the canal and at the wall and gates in the wall and so on. Next, please. Yes, and, uh, well, I, they're not in very good order, and I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to take much time. I just wanted to bring them to your attention. It's absolutely amazing. I mean, it's, uh, I should live to see such a such an extraordinary uh, thing happen. This is another of the uh, another of the leaders from his garden, uh, made to look as if it were real and uh, a real knockout. Anyway, next please. Yeah, this is a pavilion. Uh, excuse me. Uh, a, Anyway, yeah, I, uh, in the uh, middle of the garden, and it appears in a number of the leaves, uh, tower. And uh, this, this is what, next please. Yeah, there we are. So at any rate, now he presumably he's going to really recreate the garden if he can find the space and the rocks and the water and the things and enough money. So I, it may happen. I'm, not, I, I'm too old to and uh, immobile to go there and see it. But maybe some of you younger or mobile people like to see the garden. So if you do, remember me to the Jerk Garden. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is another of his, his uh, imaginary pictures of the garden, which he's recreated it. Next, please. Yes. OK, that's, that was my, my whole point. I just wanted to bring these amazing pictures to your attention uh, to uh, because they were, they were so astonishing for me, and I hope they are to you too. Next, please. Yes, okay, I think that's the last of it, is it? Yeah, okay, uh, thank you, and now on to the symposium. Me in the back? No? Yes? I don't think it's on. It's. It's. Uh, oh, well, maybe a little bit, yeah. Do you want to try it again? 
Hello? Yeah? Nice. It's better? Yeah, okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, it's such a delight to be here to honor a great scholar. As you can see, Jim hasn't lost a beat, and uh, um, it's quite amazing um, how fluent and uh, uh, precise and concise he is, uh, as always, in talking about uh, Chinese painting and er everything else. Um, okay, can we bring on the... Is it better? Um, well, since this theme of the symposium is about the perspective painting 18th century China, um, I want to say that uh, the kind of perspective I want to bring is more about once you have a space, you have a perspective recession, uh, spatial recession, so forth, you would have some kind of presence there. And that presence has, uh, as I say, some kind of a magic power of projecting a soundtrack effect so that you experience a space not just as a pure physical space out there, but also a mental space and rhetorical space and imaginary space. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. And of course, I'm going to start uh, with this painting. And we all know that, as all, always the case, that great painter great artworks are always associated with the great scholars' names, those who study it. So there's no way nowadays we can talk about and look at this painting without thinking of Jim. And Jim made this paint, painting, well, among uh, others, make this painting famous. And he also bring a very distinct perspective to this painting. Uh, in fact, um, one of the key points he make about this painting is that uh, he thinks uh, uh, Gong Xian um, uh, drew inspiration from European engraving. And since that bold uh, claim has been made, in fact, uh, Zhu Jingli also made that claim as well, but somehow uh, uh, Jim drew more, Jim's claim drew more t attention and also uh, generated more. Uh, controversy, especially in China, and I think uh, people tend to misunderstood, uh, mis misunderstand him. In fact, he's, his argument is much more nuanced and uh, interesting than, than his detractors make out him to be. So as always the case that when people try to um, dismantle an argument, they tend to make a caricature, a straw man of the person they want to attack and then uh, uh, basically attack that straw man, which is not him. So, um, uh, so to, I want to come to Jim's defense and also to say that his argument is actually much more nuanced, that in fact, uh, if we want to uh, summarize what he said, uh, here's what he's, his point, that in fact there, is a, there isn't anything like this in the history of Chinese painting, and that um, and nothing quite worked at that moment to present that particular event uh -oh, situation. And therefore, uh, Gong Xian went out of the system to look elsewhere for source of inspiration. And that he found in European engraving. And also, uh, Jim made the very interesting point that um, um, overall, it is really this calm effect of the storm that Gong Xian is trying to project. So uh, essentially what I'm going to talk about today is actually give you a long, prolonged, extended footnote to Jim's precious insight. All right, um, this is a pair that uh, Jim Shu in his book, uh, Compelling Image, and well known. Uh, so I wouldn't repeat analysis there. I still urge you to read uh, that wonderful chapter. Um, the, but my point, and my starting point really, is to revisit this famous case, which is why, how did Gong Xian um, reach this state 
in other words, from uh, initially bland, so-called white gong, as people call it, uh, to black gong. And that took about 10 years for that to happen. But the re most remarkable thing is that once that happened, Gong Xian never rever uh, looked back. You know, he never, it's not like an a, a artist having different kinds of styles and then and choose to play with different options. In fact, this is a fundamental change that occurred in Dong, Gong Xian's career. So, and if you look at the timeline, and this is kind of, kind of neat, this is the inside uh, decade. So what is it about 1660s that caused this big change? In other words, what is it the 1660s that, sorry. Maybe this is where to, oh yeah, I'm fine, thank you. So, um, what is this? Uh, no. <laughs> How come? Oh, anyway, never mind. Just do this. Um, I'm going to. This is the wrong side. Yeah. <laughs> yes, this is wrong. Okay. Sixteen <coughs> sixties. And that coincided with the reign of this individual named Obai, or you can't forget this name if you if you think of it as an old boy. <laughs> uh, uh, and essentially he was one of the four regions that Shun's Emperor appointed as the re, uh, as the uh, supervisor of the region overseeing when uh, Kangxi Emperor was in majority, and uh, Kangxi Emperor uh, went on the throne in uh, 1661, 1662, um, as a eight-year-old. So uh, it was during this all by regency that a lot of uh, bad things happened. Um, as we all know in China, that uh, this shouldn't be just attributed to one harsh draconian ruler or individual. It's, it tend to take um, more people involved. And in fact, it's not just the Manchu versus the Han Chinese. In fact, uh, some of the local governors were overzealous in um, collaborating with the central government in persecuting uh, the Jiangnan uh, gentries. So, <coughs> Um, and it was during this period, there were three major cases, and I wouldn't go through all the details, just to say that this is, uh, uh, especially the second and third case, was really uh, that some Zhangnan gentry wanted to expose corruption at the local level, um, and then the, the governor actually um, overreacted and then also made the, made the, uh, took the chance to, to punish these gentries. So a, a huge number of very respectable Jiangnan gentry, a lot of them already sitting on uh, official posts, were punished and a lot of them were killed and publicly humiliated. So it was a very dark period. and. Um, so it was out of this period that the uh, scholars start to change their tone. And it was in this period, uh, Chen Chen Yi, one of the most eminent uh, intellectuals, actually proposed a, what he called the, um, the, the doll of sound, or the way of sound. Um, <clears throat> and if you look at the, I mean, this is, he had a whole theory about uh, what, how one should practice poetry. Uh, in which he took to be a way of the sound. And if you look at the, uh, the, the key phrases, you could see that there's a, lot, a great deal of howling and shouting and so forth. In other words, it is, to some extent, uh, an art of sound and noise, a noise making. <clears throat> now, um, he's essentially a poet. How does that translate into painting? Um, 
so painters actually took two cues from this kind of rhetoric. By the way, this rhetoric, of course, had been around in early Qing. In fact, uh, even going way back, but it was during the early Qing, and especially during 1660s, that this kind of rhetoric and tropes gain uh, more currency. So, <clears throat> and they, some of them went all the way back. The allusion is actually uh, in, the, in the Song Yuan tradition that um, uh, individuals were known to go to high places to uh, mourn for martyrs. And so the crying at the pavilion became uh, one of the established uh, conceit in poetic uh, discourse. And they also translated into painting as well. So here's a painting by Xiao Yingcong, <coughs> who uh, f famously painted the uh, uh, crying at the Western Terrace, Tongku Xi Tai. Presumably, uh, but at that time it was before Chen Jian Yi's uh, proposed this uh, so called uh, Dao of Sound. But the, the rhetoric uh, they, they, they kind of shared. And if you look at the, the painting, um, you could see that there was this prominence of the pavilion, high up there in some kind of rock formation. And then also very pointedly, and you would recognize a lot of in early Qing painting, is the interplay between some kind of a barren tree, decaying tree, and full blooming tree. The idea is really to <coughs> to um, A, give you a sense of changing times and circumstances, B, to give you a sense of emotional register. That is, that pavilion is a cue uh, for you to cry, in fact. <coughs> and not surprisingly, we see that detail in Gong Xian's painting. And I think, to some extent, he was just being part of the trend. Uh, you see that, that interplay of the barren tree and the blooming tree in the proximity of the pavilion. <coughs> and here's the whole um, composition. Now, this is a very powerful image. Once you realize that there is a great emotional presence anchored by that tree and that pavilion, you're going to look at this uh, distant vista with a different sense. It's almost like some kind of individual uh, presence is standing vis-a-vis -vis this vast, uh, dark space. And the idea is more like uh, this European uh, painting, uh, where uh, a German painting, uh, that you have the contemplating subject looking at the vast landscape. And incidentally, this uh, painting become one of the most popular uh, book cover in when people write about poetry. And because uh, it, it was about poet thinking, which is a way to say that uh, the, the sound of voice, and, and that, of course, is the, what is Chinese painting implies. In other words, there is that contemplating subjectivity occupying the, f the foreground, um, taking it all in with some kind of uh, thinking uh, going. Now, um, in <coughs> I remember well uh, uh, Arthur Whaley's famous dictum that without dates, um, historians uh, indulge in asceticism, by which that we, you can't do much about with historical circumstances. But fortunately, with this painting, we can't because it was dated uh, 1671 uh, 71 in uh, Nelson Atkins Museum. Uh, uh, this is also one of my favorite. Uh, paintings of all time. And you see a, a, a very lonely tree in the foreground looking at the distant vista, and there's that uh, very suggestive uh, colored tower. And obviously the formula is about some kind of contemplation about changing historical circumstances. <coughs> and, um, and the playwright named Kong Shangren, who interviewed the painter, uh, eventually came up with these uh, beautiful evocative lines about the changing dynastic change, uh, 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 the vicissitudes of uh, history that came down just to a few plucks of spring, a string, and also all that life 
comes down to a high note song that startles <coughs> the mirror peaks. It's one of the most beautiful, beautiful lines. <coughs> now, this, this painting actually, this composition actually has a history. Uh, 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 Gong Xian didn't invent it, as you can see, that you can see the tree in the foreground and the, uh, the hill in the background. So essentially, this is a late Ming painting by uh, uh, Xiang Shenmo. And, um, and what it cues is a kind of e emotional, uh, poetic soundtrack. And here we can play a little game about how, well, to demonstrate how uh, the, the, the poetic composition, sometimes it's just a game in Lake Ming, especially in Lake Ming. So uh, I can give you a few key words, and, and, and for anyone who's practiced in Chinese poetry or lyric song making, you could actually immediately come up with some kind of scenario, a lyrical scenario. And typically it, was, it would be built on, on the weeping willow, and the willow would signify the passing spring, and thereby, uh, and all the willow would give out the catkins, which would cause you to tear up a bit. And uh, uh, either at the, either you have a hay fever, or you uh, you're just at the thought of the passing spring give you sad thoughts. And then you think about, uh, uh, you look ahead, you look at the uh, that distant vista, which is could be cloud, uh, or could be mist that you can know your future destiny. And then you think about going home, and mostly in some of the scenario, it's uh, you have spent all this um, time in the capital city, and um, probably consorting with uh, young women. And then now it's time to return home. You say goodbye to the your lover, and then you become sad. So that's a standard formula. It, 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 it can, it, it's just constantly being played and replayed and replayed in various kind of comp, uh, poetic compositions. And here, for instance, th th this is, if you set it to a tune, it will be something like this. And this is, in fact, a, a song, a zi poem. And that will flesh out all this. But um, so essentially, once you're familiar with this kind of formula, uh, you can play this game and, and really map this onto the painting. And thereby also you know how painting works in, in queuing for certain kind of set uh, poetic patterns, right? Now, that was then, that was the late Ming, but uh, you could see how much difference 1644 had changed. Uh, before 1644, in the late Ming, you could play that kind of game with that kind of romantic yearnings and all that uh, indulgence in um, some kind of place. And then you, you, after the 1644, you could see that the hill has been changed into the hanging um, rock formation, which is either way of saying uh, a, a fragmented mountain, Ban Bi Jiang San, or or um, um, in any case, you know what that means uh, in the early Qin. So, <coughs> willows still play a key role, as you can see in this uh, painting, contemporary to Xiang Zemmo's early Qin painting. Uh, you could see the willow, and then you could see that uh, sail in the distance, up left. So the idea is that, yes, it is passing spring, time has changed, uh, river goes on, and, and you feel sad. And the, point makes, uh, the, the painter actually makes a great point about using this very charged uh, barren willow tree. In fact, this is so powerful. If you notice that, that the tree actually is repeated twice to give you a changing uh, time, the same tree, but the tree has uh, gained new life uh, despite. And also it's kind of interesting to see to make this, these, these uh, embodiment of cycles of changing circumstances so pointed that they actually uh, contrast that with those disembodied willow, weeping willows. It's almost like saying that, that there are some, some kind of those willows who are disembodied, floating, free floating without root. And here we are, we are rooted. We are the sort of trees that can stay to the ground, unlike those weather 
a vein kind of willow trees, right? So, um, and you could see already that one of the uh, challenge and the, for the painter, therefore, is how to make the willow unwillow-like, right? Because uh, the willows, they worry, often give you the wrong idea, romantic association, all those kind of things. They, the slender female waist, uh, those are the sort of typical associations. So, but in early Qing, they want to make sure that you don't get to that kind of wrong idea. And one of the ways you do is to actually uh, make the willow barren tree look anything but willow. So here's Gongxian, and you, at the outset, you wouldn't think that these are willow trees, are they? You would, I mean, so this is an iconographer's nightmare. If you were to argue that these are willow trees, no student would ever believe you. But in fact, uh, the, the starting from here, the, uh, the, the, the painter, this is actually instruction manual. He teaches his student how to paint willow. And the instruction came, comes down essentially to like, if you want to paint a good willow, don't think about willow. Paint a barren tree and don't rush to put on those weeping willow branches. Uh, after you've done your barren tree, start to add a little, and then you get your willow. So which is essentially to say that if you want to paint your willow, don't do willow. <laughs> uh, uh, so that, and, and, he, and this is a sharp contrast with his friend, uh, Yang Wenchong of Lake Ming. You could see that, that is typical Lake Ming willow. So slender, beautiful, romantic, um, and evoking uh, uh, association with the female, uh, waist and all that figures, but, and here's Gongxian's willow, I think it's willow. When I presented this in Taipei, a Fu, Fu Shen liked my talk, but he challenged that, how can you establish that's willow? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> and I think that's willow. Uh, so then the question is, why did willow tree all of a sudden around 1671 become such a big deal? Uh, it, it, well, the, you know, Chinese painters paint willow all the time, but it was particularly around this time that actually uh, willow tree become very charged and pointed. And let me take you to a bit of uh, history. And 1644, Beijing fell, the emperor, Ming emperor committed suicide, and then Ma Shiying established uh, the Southern Ming court, and, um, and he but, but he turned out, and the Southern Ming government turned out to be extremely incompetent, and uh, so causing a lot of resentment. And then uh, a general named Zuo Liangyu uh, in Wuhan, for some reason, decided that he wanted to go to Nanjing to get those, uh, get Ma, Ma Shiying, uh, all these other people. And, according to some historians, actually, the person who went to persuade him was this, uh, the, this storyteller named Liu Jingting. Actually, this guy was born in uh, Taizhou in north of uh, Yangtze River, and he across river and want to remake himself, and he found himself under willow tree, and then he said, okay, it, it, this is my destiny to be a willow. So he changed his name. Initially, he was named Liu, so he changed the name to Liu, uh, um, Liu Jingting. Um, and, and then um, he f frequented uh, aristocrats' uh, residences and giving stories and performance. And then he also had the savvy to ask their uh, uh, signatures and autographs. And then he would go to f more house parties and show that he knew all these big shots and thereby it's establishing him himself as a big shot. Uh, as a, so all the... Um, um, uh, Nanjing aristocrat uh, families want to have him at the party to uh, give storytelling performance. And so it was said that he went to Wuhan to persuade Zhou Liangyu to attack uh, the Southern Ming government. But so Zhou Liangyu's army started to uh, uh, forge eastward, uh, eastward uh, along the Yangtze River. And then the Nanjing government government got panicky, so they actually took away the army that was defending uh, Yangzhou uh, in the north and shift that army to the west of Nanjing in defense or in anticipation of Zhou Liangyu's army coming to the east. And unfortunately, 
uh, when Zhu Liangyi's army went to uh, Jiujiang, uh, he mysteriously died out of sickness. So that, and then the, then the Southern Ming army didn't have time enough to get back to Yangzhou, and Yangzhou fell when Dodo, the Manchu army, uh, stormed the city, and there was this, then the famous uh, massacre of Yangzhou, and tens of thousands of people were killed. And then um, uh, Chen Qianyi, all these other Southern Ming officials, in order to avoid that massacre to happen again, they surrendered to the Qing uh, army and opened the city of Nanjing to the Qing, and then the rest is Qing history. Um, <clears throat> So, oh, yeah, that's, uh, so that was the famous um, um, General Dodo attacking Yangzhou and Shi Kefa, the, the um, Southern Ming general, uh, committed suicide. And so that happened some time ago. And then 1671, Liu Jingting turned 80. Um, by the way, this is probably just a fiction because, uh, according to some historians, no one knows when Liu Jingting was born. Uh, but, but, but somehow, the, the, someone made a, made a big case that uh, he turned 80 uh, around 16, or on 1671. So there was a great deal of outpouring on the queue of Liu Jingting turning uh, sem, uh, 80. Uh, so, uh, people, if you are anyone at that time, you write about Liu Jingting, essentially. It's like everyone who's anyone writes about Liu Jingting. Uh, because it's just, just uh, the thing to do. Uh, and, and of course, it was a good trigger because uh, people feel like, you know, yes, because Liu Jingting really brought back all the memory. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But the, here's uh, Huang Zhongxi, uh, one of the famous uh, literators, and, uh, and that's his um, record of his feeling after hearing Liu Jingting's or recalling his experience of attending Liu Jingting's storytelling performance is that each time Liu produced a sound, the listener would immediately feel the clangor of the knives and swords and the charges of the armored battlefield horses filling up the space. It is after the winds were howling, rains were sobbing, birds were scampering and um, so on. And the rancor of the dynasty fall would immediately well up from the listener's heart. The musician clapper's sound is nothing in comparison. So it's very, you could see how the mental image uh, has been conjured up at Liu Jingting's kind of storytelling. Now, here's the interesting thing. <coughs> so once you, you, you have that in mind and you look at this, you can't help but conjuring up all that soundtrack. And if you think I'm delusional, <laughs> and I have hard proof, this is Arthur Whaley without knowing all about this. It's remarkable, because Arthur Whaley and uh, uh, Sick, Lawrence Sickman, they all heard the sound. Uh, they all heard, so, so Arthur Whaley looking at this painting as a vast battlefield strewn with sinister wreckage. So you could see that, right? It's exactly like what Huang Zhongxi wrote about. And S Sigmund said, a vision of blasted uh, landscape. So they all heard this soundtrack. Um, and if you compare the two, it's remarkably, uh, they, they, they really talk to each other. And so, as I said, everyone at that time who was anyone wrote about uh, Wu, Yi, uh, Wu Yi wrote, Mao Zhang wrote, and everyone wrote about. And it's also, uh, you know, the typical uh, trope is that, you know, this colored tower, the same willow, or the same old willow. It's essentially what is depicted here, right? Um, so why, 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 so Liu Jingting by that time actually was kind of already in some, some kind of obscurity, but all of a sudden he's revived, or the interest in him was revived, so people started to write about Willow and Solitary Willow and the storytelling and the soundtrack and so forth. Um, it, it actually, it's not so much the sort of yearning for the Ming, by 1660s, uh, people pretty, move, pretty much moved on. It was no longer 
Ming was more of a rhetorical trope. It's not something like that. Oh, we can really go back to Ming. Uh, a lot of people already accept it. But the point is, as I said, the 1660 was a bad time. So you, you feel everything is so bad, and you start to wonder, why did we get so bad? And then the thought of Liu Jingting start to make you think further. Is that what if Liu succeeded in persuade? Well, he did succeed. Persuaded Zhu Liangyu. But the question more is, what if Zhu Liangyu didn't die? And he attacked Nanjing and got rid of Ma Shiying. Would we have still be this bad? So that's the sort of question people pose for themselves. Therefore, there's a great deal of thinking about history uh, posing these kind of questions. So, OK, what I've been talking the way I talk about painting sounds like it, everything hinges on a few images. And so that doesn't make painting painting, because poets could also use solitary willow to talk about the same things. So here I want to demonstrate how painting, the medium, would make a difference. In other words, how, do you, how did the painter make their ink sing and around 1670? So here's, uh, I'll give you a few examples. And here's Fan Qi, uh, 1669. And Wang Jian, uh, one of the four Wangs. You would think that he wouldn't do anything so crazy. But uh, apparently, at that time, he was just as stirred up as everyone else. Instead of that passive four Wang notion you have in mind, you actually would have this very agitated, stormy scene that Wang Jian uh, painted 1669 and Gongxian, uh, uh, 1671. So they, uh, they all had the willow tree, they all have the pavilion, they all have the, uh, in this, and on the right, uh, at least a sense of the city of Nanjing, um, um, the sort of historical memory all evoked there. Now, it is this painting, I think, full, fully embodies what an uh, ink medium can do to, to sing. What um, the problem here is, actually, we start with a riddle uh, that the painter inscribed on the painting. He said something to the effect that uh, Li Zhan truly have this painting. No one believed me. I therefore painted this one so that people can believe me. Oh, oh, oh. For, for those who actually share my knowledge. For anyone, for any students of Chinese painting, you would know that that's uh, impossible. Because Nizan would never have done same, uh, something like that. Uh, uh, and, um, and in fact, what the painter probably is resorting to is more of like a, a me a landscape. So why is it that he choose to insist on that this is more Nizan rather than uh, me? So that has to do with early Qing situation as well. And you could see that Gongxian was, in 1658, was following a suit, and everyone was into Ni Zhan. So he, as a, someone who wants to strive for recognition, obviously, has to be respectable. And to, to be respectable is to paint Li Zhan, and vice versa. Uh, but they have tons of problems with Ni Zhan uh, in early Qing, because it was too weak, too anemic, too it lacks v vigor when early Qing people feel that they need a lot of invigoration. So they feel like they want to change Li Zhan, remodel Li Zhan. And the way they want to remodel Li Zhan is to uh, is resort to this uh, dark tone formation, rock formation. And this is a, uh, you could see that uh, Xiang Zheng Mo painted this in early Qing. And he, t he says this is, he, he essentially was saying the same thing as well. Uh, Li Zhen actually did something like this, but no one believed me. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm doing this as well so that you, you, un you understand that it is possible to have Li Zhen like this. Now, if you move that aside, and you could see that they were all drawing some kind of inspiration from another alternative tradition, which is the Mi tradition with its dark hue, dark tones. Uh, but Mi also had its own problem, the Mi model, not the Mi person. The Mi model has its own problem. And here we get to the fundamental property of Chinese ink painting. 
for ink to sing, you need to make it very washy, very diluted, uh, very uh, water saturated, so that it has a sort of free flowing association. Therefore, you have a sense of rhythm. And it's almost like a, 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 there's a sort of singing quality to it. Uh, and the problem with the dry ink is that you don't have that sense. You have a sort of check frustration um, uh, being held. And so to have a free flowing uh, ink, or ink wash is tantamount to having some, acquire some singing quality. And that's where, oh, sorry. That's where the European engraving comes in, I think, because uh, for early Qing people, they wanted to have a, some kind of singing going on, but then they also feel that to sing sometimes is a bit too romantic, too uh, Lake Ming-like, uh, which they didn't quite like. So they want to dry it up. But once you dry up, you, 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 you so there's a, there's a quandrum, there's a dilemma there. And, and, and I think uh, Jim is absolutely right that uh, uh, Gong Xian saw this problem and he didn't have a way out. So the way he tried to reinvent the wheel is actually to resort to European engraving where you could have some kind of uh, right kind of mood um, uh, without getting the wrong association with the Mi tradition. All right, so, and since we're at Berkeley, uh, to talk about these uh, two qualities is actually relevant because uh, Frederick Wickman, in his study of early Qing situation, actually came up with these two character types and two profiles. It's extremely important for us as our historians, actually. Basically, he, he grouped the early Qing individuals into two well, uh, two types. One is romantics, uh, exemplified by people like Chen Qianyi, Wu Weiye, and that all go back to the Liu Fang tradition. And they were very romantic, imaginary, gifted. Uh, um, and then there were these Stoics, Chen Zilong, Gu Yanwu, Wan uh, Shouqi, who were uncompromising in sticking to ethical standards, and, and, but giving people a sense of some kind of being a bit uptight, but they're very principled. So, um, <clears throat> and it's remarkable that each type produces a corresponding kind of painting, and that you can see that the romantic types is more given to some kind of ink washes, whereas the Stoics tend to go for dry ink. And this is quite remarkable, uh, how one's personality somehow, you would think that person sometimes is just uh, your own self-fashioning, but sometimes you just can't help it. If you're romantic, you're romantic. You're actually your story. Uh, and you could, you could see, if you bring Gong Xian's painting in, you could see that he's neither of those, right? He has uh, enough in him to be a bit romantic, but then he would, he would also studiously avoid the wet ink washes to have that sort of uh, gravity. Um, and you can also see how same individual, like Shang Shengmu, who in the early Ming was more of a romantic, and then he kind of sobers up after the, uh, uh, the fall of dynasty. <coughs> And again, you, you, you position uh, Gong Xian into this storyline, you could see that he is in between. And he wants still to sing a bit more, unlike the stoic uh, silence that embodied in the stoic kind of painting. He wants to sing, but he doesn't want to have the late main kind of singing. Um, and that brings us to one of the, this is the Metropolitan Museum, uh, New York, and one of the most beautiful painting, it essentially talks about uh, singing and dancing, and it's talking about um, the moon scene, and then after getting drunk, an old fisherman was seen, and then the uh, poor garden girl would choke amidst 
her madrigal. Essentially, uh, this sort of scenario is beautifully captured in this bend tree that also very nicely rhymes visually with that fish uh, uh, net uh, stand. And what is even more remarkable, and this is very important to see how early Qing artists like Gong Xian would render a kind of singing in the way he modulate his inequality. So he would give you, still give you a kind of wash, but so that you would get a sense of somehow singing is getting, is getting going. But then he would hold it back by rendering layers and layers of dry brushwork so that you don't have that kind of just get it out so-called spontaneous kind of singing. singing. It's a sort of song choked, as we saw in the earlier picture, choked in the midway. And <clears throat> you could see the same this, the technique is used in this long hand scroll in Nelson um, Atkins Museum. It's a long, long hand scroll. And in, on the river scene, you could see this uh, singing quality going there. Now, his most astounding part of how history is complicated and how we shouldn't take easy uh, 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 p positions or generalizations. In, towards the end of the scroll, Gong Xian wrote the colophon. And he said, in my later years, I'm especially fond of the two men of Guizhou. The voice of their brushes and manner of ink can sing and dance. Now, who are the two men of Guizhou? <coughs> One is a martyr, late Ming martyr. Another is much hated Ma Shiying. In other words, it's almost like entirely politically incorrect for him to like Ma Shiying, but he couldn't help it. He actually had his soft spot for Ma Shiying. So you could see, the, well, just to go back to the uh, history a bit to recall, you know, Ma Shiying was, uh, was made a villain in early, Ming, uh, early Qing. So therefore, if we reread these lines, basically uh, by Kong um, Shangren, who interviewed Gong uh, Xian, and then eventually come up with this, this lyrical voice, and you could see that this is sort of unfocused singing. Uh, there's no thematic thrust. It's more about just sad to be sad, because there isn't anything you can say about history. And that's why you probably need to sing instead of making a uh, discursive announce pronouncement on history, because what can you say? It's such a, such a complicated, confused matter. And for someone like Gong Xian, of course, he was once also a Fu Shu member, and then he, but also he sided with, oh, he has soft spot for Ma Shiying, the villain. So in the end, it's about uh, singing about this dream-like landscape, uh, this nostalgia for the old lands, but, uh, and the, the, the last line is particularly poignant, uh, let me well uncheckered as old age hastens nigh. Now, uh, the play also construct another voice, which is somewhat different. The earlier one voice you heard has more of howling, which is more like a Chen Chen Yi kind of uh, way of sound. And this one is much more uh, 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 transcendent, should we say. It's more going towards certain kind of calm. Jim talks about Gong Xian's painting has this quality of calm. That is exactly what it is about. In other words, all that landscape is all empty, vast empty landscape. You couldn't hear any vo noise. And then just as the deadening sound lasts, all of a sudden there's this little pluck of string that gives you a little note that reverberate throughout this landscape. In the same way that you would have this tenor notes, this high note, that can startle the mirror mountains. You could see how uh, powerful and effective it is. And that is really equivalent to this painting. Um, uh, what the Gong Xian, what Gong Xian did is precisely project that kind of 
uh, effect. In fact, Gong Xian himself confessed that after all that stormy 1660s, he want a bit quietness and calm. And he said, the, the most supreme ascetic state I want to strive for is to hear the chimes and bells of distant Buddhist monasteries. And that, I think, is the effect captured in this painting. And if you line these two up, you could see that the upper painting is more caught up in the 1660s. Uh, Jim thinks it's more like around 1670, and other people think that it's as late 1660s. And, well, there's no way of finally knowing. But as, uh, 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 through the logic uh, I just spelled out, probably this is more in this kind of sequence. In any case, comparing with the two, you could see that the 1661 is the morning after, is that striving after that serene uh, effect. Then, and it's, I also want to say that it's a very charged moment. The 1670 is, I think, very, very key, uh, crucial moment in the history of Chinese aesthetics, Chinese painting, and Chinese thought. Uh, because different propositions were made. You could see that Fan Qi's painting uh, compositionally, or thematically, iconographically, probably depict the same situation on the same cue that Liu Jingting was turning 70. But how different they are. One is color, another is somberingly uh, monochrome. And you would think that, that Fan Qi is a colorist. You're wrong. Actually, early on, in the early Qing, he actually painted this uh, female beauty painting. Since we are celebrating our exhibition, Female Beauty, I want to bring this painting up. And this is a way of him um, meditating on the changing history uh, or changing circumstances. But by 1669, he's moving on. He's, he, he's attaining a different kind of ascetic uh, sensibility. And here we want to bring a very, very key figure who was not much of a painter, but he lurks behind all these paintings. And his name is Wang Shizhen. And He's a complicated individual, but uh, he was barely 10 when the dynastic fall happened. Uh, so he had a dim memory. His family members were killed uh, by the Manchus, but then he himself was promoted to be the Yangzhou magistrate uh, serving the Qing government. So, uh, and remember that Huang Zhongxi uh, writing about how he felt so strongly after hearing Liu Jingting's storytelling. And Wang Shizhen basically said, oh, what's the big deal? He's just a street player. In other words, you could see the same uh, sound is completely lost on Wang Shizhen. And he advocated for a different kind of aesthetic, uh, uh, what, what, the, what is he called the art of the ineffable. And he, he advocated for spiritual resonances and also for this balance, calmness, and distance. Since we talk about the perspective of painting, I want just want to say that if we want to talk about perspective of painting and the spatial quality of uh, painting in early Qing, one has to take into account all these kind of uh, underpinnings. And you could see that essentially he is paving the way for a different kind of model. He's moving on, whereas Gong Xian is stuck in his kind of universe. And is it more of a generation thing? Um, so it's not an, in other words, Gong Xian's painting wasn't much of a big deal in his own time. Even his closest friend, Kong Shangren, I just checked, uh, uh, didn't collect a single Gong Xian painting. He helped out with Gong Xian's, the care of Gong Xian's funeral and everything. He's, He's buddy buddy with Gong Xian, but he didn't collect Gong Xian painting. And you, if you read uh, uh, early Qing people writing about Gong Xian, they ba basically feel they didn't know what to do with him. So the way they want to praise him to say that there isn't anything like him, nor was there anything after him. Uh, by that, you could say, well, he's great. Another way of saying that his contemporary didn't quite understand him. It was not until it took another war, the Opium War, for the Chinese to fully 
understand, appreciate Gongxian. Uh, so it was in the late second half of the 19th century, Gongxian's stock went up and he, got, he was rediscovered and appreciated. And he is a late Qing uh, ascetic theorist who, who praised this kind of melancholy and repeated press and turns. And he's not about talk, talking about Gongxian, but essentially uh, the, the same aesthetic uh, quality that Gongxian's painting um, embodies that uh, late Qing critic uh, start to embrace and recognize. And therefore, I think the, the first critic in history who uh, for really, uh, other than Jim, <laughs> the first critic who really got, uh, understood uh, Gongxian was Wu Changshuo. And this is what a uh, late Qing uh, critic, and he basically said that um, uh, Gong's use of brush is somber, saturated, grave, and solemn. It is as if he had suppressed melancholy feeling inside that had built up but had not found its release. And I think that's a, the, one of the most uh, accurate, apt uh, formulation of Gong Jian's painting. And I want to end with the Jim's reading, and you could see how absolutely he's right on there. And he could represent unreal worlds as if they were real, making them substantial and visually persuasive, revealing the uneasier, that's a, that's a key word, that's a key word, the uneasier kind of peace he had attained. Thank you, Jim. Well, uh, this is an unexpectedly appropriate title because our honoree has temporarily vanished. <laughs> but uh, it's a great uh, pleasure, as always, to be back at Berkeley, where I spent my graduate student years in Jim's uh, company, um, working on some of his projects and uh, spending a lot of time uh, looking at paintings in the museum, as I've just spent the, uh, the earlier afternoon doing with that splendid exhibition that's based so uh, closely on his, on his research. Uh, and uh, that lesson of, that you see uh, marked in many of the labels um, of writing through uh, paintings, really, uh, through the experience and, and uh, uh, encounter with them uh, has always uh, stuck with me. And uh, I want to uh, begin with uh, that complex of works and one of the most um, striking uh, and uh, thought-provoking themes in his uh, Jim Cahill's Pictures, of, uh, Pictures for Use and Pleasure, uh, which is in many ways the basis for the uh, uh, Revealing Beauty uh, uh, exhibition on view, uh, concerning uh, urban vernacular painting in 17th and 18th century China. Uh, is the notion of looking through pictures, that is looking hyphen through kinds of pictures, uh, or what he sometimes uh, in his uh, text um, uh, calls see-through uh, paintings or see-through pictures. Um, and uh, there are a number of examples that are marked in, uh, in his uh, text and uh, there's, a, there's a kind of terminology that's uh, associated with this notion of uh, the see-through or, or looking through uh, kind of uh, picture, which is another way of, of marking um, a kind of uh, perspectival uh, painting. 
Uh, and it has its own uh, Chinese terminology. It's not exactly clear that the, uh, for contemporary uh, uh, writers, that is in the, in the High Qing period, in the late 17th, early 18th century, that these terms had quite the, the um, valence that, that uh, Jim uh, lends them. Um, but uh, he sees this uh, mode of uh, looking through pictures as a prominent and perhaps predominant type of system for producing new effects of pictorial space in this period and in these environments, which include both the urban centers of southeastern China, Yangzhou, Suzhou, and nearby uh, cities, and also um, uh, production at court. By this term, he emphasizes pictures that invite visual penetration uh, by uh, somewhat uh, abrupt uh, recessions, often through open windows, portals, or doorways, and often via interrupted or, or partially blocked routes, sometimes set at acute angles rather than through the more orderly uh, linear perspective kind of framework or cage that's marked by grids or by a, a geometric framework. It's an idea with a, a very interesting uh, genealogy. It's related in some ways to the distinction that Svetlana Alpers, Jim's longtime uh, colleague in the department here at Berkeley, drew some decades ago between a northern European, uh, as she put it, uh, art or arts of describing in, uh, in Dutch visual culture uh, and uh, the Italian narrative pictorial uh, stages that were more characteristic of southern Europe. And in this kind of formulation, uh, Chinese urban pictures of the looking through or see through mode are more or less northern. In fact, Jim uses that terminology a bit in his book in a, in a sort of transcultural sense in distinction from the, again, the evenly measured uh, Italianate uh, uh, perspectival frameworks. We often take, or at least I do, uh, to be the sort of default mode of perspectival painting. The historical mechanism for the transmission of this mode would most likely have been, uh, originally at least, the Flemish engravings of Christian and uh, geographical atlas imagery of the sort that uh, an example of the uh, geographical uh, type Jim showed in his uh, introduction, of the sort brought to China by Jesuit missionaries in the late 1500s and uh, after. Uh, so whatever the original sources for this uh, uh, see-through uh, pictorial mode, in, in Jim Cahill's account, it functions as much more than just a structural technique or a classifying device, but rather a, as the basis for a whole order of visuality uh, arresting, invitational, and supplicating the gazes of viewers into often feminine or uh, eroticized spaces. And of course, that's a prominent theme uh, in his uh, book and in the exhibition as well. And it's, a, it's an interesting term uh, uh, with many uh, uh, kinds of implications, including uh, what you see here, perhaps the notion of a kind of transparency, see-through in that sense, and which is very in that sense, and very prominent in the more explicitly erotic pictures uh, on view uh, at the museum uh, of, uh, of transparent uh, draperies and so on, as well as a, a deeper kind of uh, uh, penetrating space. The mode, as we see it in some of these examples, also operated strongly at the Qing Dynasty court in Beijing, uh, as in some of these uh, examples. but. In the context of southeastern Chinese urban centers of art production, such as Suzhou and Yangzhou, including the, the artist shown here, who's a kind of discovery or rediscovery of Jim's research, it might be seen as a pictorial counterpart to the urban uh, experience of streetscapes or more or less directly and perhaps more likely uh, something that envisions an, emerg uh, an urban imaginary of desire that offers visual access to hidden and private, ordinarily private, feminine spaces. In many such examples, uh, a strong architecturally defined linear architectural perspective uh, coexists with uh, uh, these uh, somehow uh, nested or, or partially occluded uh, spaces. Um, and, um, for example, uh, in this uh, uh, work by Lung Mei, you have a bit of both, a kind of winding, indirect route through the, uh, the window openings and moon window and so on into uh, uh, partially uh, obscured spaces, but also a strong sense of a perspectival recession along the 
uh, garden walls. Um, and, uh, but if we just juxtapose these types uh, uh, that uh, are, seem to be central to uh, uh, Jim's account of things, uh, with the more exaggerated, uh, in some ways forced perspective of, of Chinese versions of what my, in, J in Japan are called ukiye or, or perspective uh, pictures, uh, as they're shown prominently in the so-called sujoban or sujo prints of the uh, uh, mid 18th century, uh, with often this kind of, as you see on your right, this long, uh, long corridors or tunnel-like uh, recessions that are measured out uh, sometimes uh, along walls or, or facades or colonnades, and uh, as here, culminating in diminutive central pavilions. Uh, if you, uh, in this kind of distinction, uh, I think uh, Jim's, um, uh, the distinction that Jim draws, I think, remains very useful. And a more extreme example, uh, this uh, uh, print of the Forbidden City uh, in, in an uh, extreme uh, sort of compression uh, 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 and, and corridor of space. The perspective pictures, uh, uh, and again they have, we might use uh, the Chinese terms uh, xianfa tu or xianfa hua to distinguish them from the looking through uh, type, uh, also uh, offer uh, clear vanishing points. Indeed, these might in some cases be understood as the as sort of raison d'etre uh, for the images in terms of their visual impact. Uh, they are centralized and uh, very distinctive. Uh, though they offer, these images offer other kinds of scenic interest as well. In the uh, see-through type of picture, I hope I can, I'm not sure if I can go back. I guess maybe that's not so easy to do. Uh, no, I wanted to go backwards actually. No, no, uh, they say you, you can't, uh, so just have to. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, in this looking through or see through type of picture, the vanishing points are, are tend to be sort of off stage. That is, they are uh, outside the uh, the visual uh, arena uh, presented to the viewer, uh, and uh, in, in that sense, they're uh, invisible or, or vanished in a different sense as points of attention, and so don't uh, compete with the material or, in some cases, erotic spectacles that are the main focus of the pictorial display. Uh, somewhat paradoxically, in these pictures organized around clear vanishing points, uh, the latter are strongly materialized, or uh, as here, marked uh, by distant uh, pavilions or gateways. There are other interesting uh, paradoxes and uh, complications surrounding the notion and deployment of vanishing points. And one of the most uh, accomplished uh, uh, instances of the device, uh, Gauli's uh, famous ceiling fresco for the again, Jesuit Church of Il Gesù in, in Rome, the painting accomplishes an illusory vanishing uh, all the way up to the, uh, of the church ceiling itself, uh, while the vanishing point uh, is a site both uh, of dematerialization and one might say of plenitude uh, as the uh, focal point of the uh, uh, adored uh, name of Jesus. Uh, and as the light uh, that emanates from, from that point and Jesus' name uh, as the point of triumph and adoration, bathes uh, the saints above and, and scatters uh, heretics below. Of course, this kind of image uh, would not have been uh, accessible to uh, Chinese uh, artists, but um, uh, one of um, uh, the, the sort of colleagues uh, uh, and a Jesuit uh, a muralist, uh, 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 Pazzo, uh, did uh, write a treatise on the theory of, uh, of this uh, elaborate and complex kind of uh, perspectival projection uh, that was uh, rendered in, into uh, Chinese uh, translation in the early 18th century. So uh, just as the notion of looking through pictures or see through pictures involves more than just a set of visual devices, I'd like briefly to consider some of the diverse implications uh, of the other kind. Uh, in, in, uh, in Jim's treatment, that is, of the uh, uh, vanishing point kind of, uh, of painting. I'll begin uh, with uh, a, a very interesting uh, pr painting produced at the early Qing court, uh, known as uh, Beauties uh, Beneath Phoenix Tree Shade or Under uh, Wutong Trees, 
uh, as you see uh, presented here, it's uh, painted on an eight-fold screen. I feel apologize a bit for the, the quality of the reproduction. It's taken from a book, so the two, two halves, so to speak, are a little bit uh, off kilter, not, not the way they uh, would be, look on the screen. I'll show you another view of the, of the physical object in just a moment. Um, it's a, a quite a large work, uh, about 128 centimeters high and more than uh, 300 uh, in width, and uh, very notably uh, painted with oils rather than with uh, uh, ink and color uh, uh, customary uh, media at this time. It's a uh, work that's been discussed in, and very usefully in, in detail by Wu Hong and by Zhou Li Ji, uh, a Taiwan-based scholar. Uh, surviving uh, court records, uh, as their research is revealed, uh, suggest that the work may have been one of the oil paintings commissioned by the Kangxi Emperor uh, in 1712. Uh, and on the reverse, in fact, it bears a, a poetic in inscription in the, in the emperor's hand, in Kangxi's hand, which t uh, transcribes uh, what, what, is, what was already by then an ancient verse from the late third century poet Zhang Xie. Uh, a rhapsody on the spring festival at the Law River. The materiality of the uh, painting is interesting in a couple of dimensions, I think. Uh, the use of oils, uh, most uh, uh, notably, of course, but also the screen format and uh, framing, which even as here is mostly edited out. You can see a little bit of the wooden frame uh, of the screen uh, just at the bottom of the, um, of the image. Um, and um, uh, here's the, the, uh, the, the full uh, uh, format uh, uh, a little more visibly. Uh, and uh, and the, the slide that I'll mostly use, as you can see, is uh, truncated a bit at either side uh, and especially leaves out uh, the, uh, the um, phoenix trees, the wutong trees that are um, uh, present uh, on the right end of the composition. Uh, uh, for the most part, so we have to sort of you know, supply that uh, as we look at the painting uh, a, a bit in your memory. Um, the screen uh, as an object is a kind of bridge between uh, the image world uh, the, of the kind that we've been sort of cataloging uh, of all kinds of uh, perspectival painting, looking through and otherwise uh, in, uh, in various uh, formats, uh, album paintings and sets of hanging scrolls and so on. That kind of image world uh, and the environmental world of physical studios or uh, pavilions and gardens, uh, which in the Qing period and especially in the subsequent uh, Qianlong era uh, during the last two thirds of the 18th century, often entailed their own rich arrays of spatial, architectural, and uh, pictorial perspective constructions and illusions, which I expect uh, 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 has been studied in, in, uh, very richly by Nancy Berliner and I may, may well be the theme of her talk, although I'm not uh, privy to that. But this is the kind of thing, the famous uh, Qianlong uh, Retirement Pavilion uh, with its uh, mixture of real architecture and illusionistic uh, painted uh, architecture, uh, uh, bamboo screen pavilions and so on, a, a kind of grape or wisteria arbor up above that again has been uh, uh, much discussed. Uh, this, the uh, screen uh, occupies and uh, occludes physical space. I, I'm afraid to go back, but let me see if I can get it. Uh, no, I can't do that. Sorry. Just this way. Okay. You have to erase it first, I see. Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, yeah, uh, the previous one, yeah. So. Um, the screen occupies and uh, occludes physical space as an object, and it invites or demands viewing from different perspectives uh, or sides, as in this case, where there is a, a, a prominent uh, calligraphic inscription on its reverse side. And of course, depending upon its setup, it can shape uh, the physical uh, space of an environment as well or even uh, create uh, a kind of surrounding environment as a site for imaginative uh, projection, uh, as Wong Wu Hong has uh, suggested uh, would have been the case for the original arrangement of this one of 12 uh, beauties uh, of the uh, next Yongzhong uh, era, 
uh, imperial era uh, that uh, he uh, has reconstructed as being part of a, a surrounding screen for the emperor's uh, pleasure. The um, screen's, let's see if I can do that, yeah, I've done it. The screen's materiality is emphasized by its wooden panels and carved fittings below. Um, and it of course also bears a, a depiction of an architectural environment and uh, in an emphatically uh, illusionistic way, as you see uh, maybe more clearly in the image below. Uh, the foreshortened uh, stone steps in the center seem to reach out to the boundary of the uh, viewer's space and to the edge of the lower frame of the screen to the point that the frame uh, might in some ways almost be captured by the illusionistic regime of the painting and uh, then be perceived as a kind of fence in front of the painting space. The created illusionistic space is uh, in many ways uh, stage-like. Colorfully costumed uh, women uh, move in rather stately uh, uh, procession across the pavilions uh, in ground, nearby grounds and uh, the bridge uh, that uh, connects it to another structure at the left uh, within and uh, between uh, buildings that in some ways could be seen as scenographic or, or stage set like. Uh, the grid uh, of the floor tiles, a um, little uh, dim here, Let's see if I can, see what I, I don't, I don't. Oh, sorry, I can't leave it back. Uh, the grid of the floor tiles carries the illusionistic penetration deep into the shaded interior of the pavilion uh, with an effect that's uh, abetted by the uh, kind of uh, trompe l'oeil uh, surfaces on the front um, of a kind of marbled panels uh, set in its lower facade and by the sheer geometric solidity uh, of the, uh, the square stone uh, foundation uh, for the uh, pavilion and its round stone columns. Uh, the pavilion interior thus is turned into a kind of camera obscura, a darkened room uh, amidst the rest uh, with uh, the bright promise uh, of the framed scene of hills and lake at its far end in this rectangular uh, uh, opening. And uh, in a way, it's a kind of instantiation of the uh, painting as a, a view through an open window that uh, uh, associated with a kind of Albertian uh, theory of uh, painting uh, in uh, Quattrocento Europe and, and later. Uh, this uh, central framed uh, opening or uh, window picture is also a portal. Uh, matched with the narrower arched uh, opening uh, to the viewers far left in the uh, pavilion across the bridge. And both, and up, both open up to a, a somewhat uh, defamiliarized because they're framed in that way, uh, views of landscapes of lakes uh, and hills. Within the literary and visual geography of Qing China, and uh, conditioned in some ways, uh, as Wu Hong has suggested, by the poetic text on the back of the screen, which deals with the, the ancient capital of Luoyang, not exactly far south, but more south than Beijing, I guess. Um, the landscape and the women before it uh, may likely stand for the discursive and imaginary south of Jiangnan, uh, south of the Yangtze River, with its associations of pleasure and an environment and lifestyle that offered alternatives to the Manchu-dominated regime uh, of the Beijing court. Uh, so perhaps regionally and culturally exotic after all. The most visually foreign looking element in the um, uh, picture is near at hand. Uh, it's this uh, uh, very uh, uh, schematically uh, shaded um, kind of garden rock uh, as it might be uh, set in a garden pond or lake. Uh, 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 rendered with a very strong chiaroscuro effect. Uh, and uh, this rock, along with the uh, other element that we've passed over, these very strongly um, uh, marked uh, cast shadows uh, of the uh, female figures uh, and by uh, also the, uh, the columns uh, of the building. Uh, and uh, along with other elements, th this kind of trompe l'oeil uh, rendering of the, the facade the uh, scaling of the beauties uh, uh, to uh, measure out uh, perspectival diminution, 
and uh, again the uh, uh, clear um, grid-like uh, order of the architectural recession makes uh, the screen into what in some ways looks like a diagrammatic demonstration piece of the diverse um, elements and techniques of European oil painting illusionism. The cast shadows that we've passed over so far that are so prominently and even uh, insistently uh, depicted here are rare even in the most strongly perspectival uh, Chinese images, the kind that even with those uh, kind of extreme, sorry, extreme recessions that we saw uh, uh, at the beginning. And they, uh, and in some ways, embody, uh, if it's not uh, sort of uh, contradictory to say so, uh, another kind of uh, vanishing. And that's uh, the passage from body, physical form and body, to uh, shadow or reflection. Uh, the Chinese term uh, ying uh, refers to, to both or, or either. Uh, and uh, of the sort uh, that has a kind of spectral quality and some other uh, Qing uh, illusionistic paintings uh, captured in this detail. It's a little bit dim, I'm afraid, or, or blurry, from one of uh, Yao and Han's uh, Ch Chenlong era uh, court paintings, uh, a bit later than this one, in other words, where there's a kind of spectral uh, visage that uh, looks through from the other side of the, uh, the panel. Now, um, I, I want to uh, uh, move forward to suggest a connection between uh, the oil painted uh, screen, the ladies uh, in phoenix tree shade, and uh, a European image, although it's not so much uh, important uh, for uh, my uh, discussion today to uh, uh, demonstrate a particular, a particular indebtedness, but the European image is one of those uh, uh, early Jesuit uh, pictures that brought to China by missionaries uh, uh, one of Nadal's illustrations of the gospel stories that uh, had circulated in China in some forms uh, for more than uh, quite a while by this time, more than a century by the late Kangxi era in the early 1700s, uh, and images from which had been variously transposed uh, into Chinese woodblock images, sometimes more or less directly, sometimes inserted or transposed into Chinese uh, environments. Uh, or in, in, in some cases entirely translated into Chinese iconography and narratives. And many of those have been discussed by Jim and others. And most of those examples actually date from closer to the time when the, uh, this um, uh, large uh, compendium of uh, engravings was published, first in Antwerp in 1593, and, and, and many of the cases are, uh, that people have cited, uh, and sometimes very clearly uh, indebted to these um, in terms of woodblock uh, renderings of uh, some of the iconography and compositions uh, go back to the, to the mid-17th century. Nadal's uh, Compendium of Images, uh, the, the so-called Evangelica Historia Imagines, um, uh, uh, was specifically designed as an instrument of religious instruction and propagation and used as such by Jesuit missions in China and elsewhere. And some of the uh, images engraved by the uh, Antwerp-based uh, printmakers, the Virix brothers and others, were based on suites of uh, working drawings by a Roman artist named Passeri, and uh, these were based uh, in turn on earlier Italian uh, uh, pen and, and wash drawings, uh, and, and then variously supplemented by uh, an Antwerp, uh, uh, that is, northern European artist named Martin de Vos. So the project in its complicated history, uh, it might be worth noting, was after all very much a hybrid northern and southern European enterprise. Nadal's uh, images, I'll, I'll call them, although of course there are many uh, collaborator, and, the, and the, the suite was actually produced uh, posthumously, um, uh, the publication, uh, he was the, uh, the um, editor and author of commentaries to them. Um, uh, in this case, uh, it's the image of the visitation, which is early in the series of more than 150 images. And it shows some intriguing structural similarities to this uh, Ladies Under uh, Phoenix Trees uh, screen composition with allowances, of course, for the different shaped format, uh, more vertical here. The most notable are pretty straightforward. They include the gridded uh, floor, recessional floor of the central ground plane, the arched portal uh, at the left of the composition, 
And uh, quite interestingly, for my concern here, the, the central window or window picture, uh, as, it, as it seems to be, occupied, in this case, by the scene of Mary returning to Nazareth with Joseph uh, following her, her visit uh, to Elizabeth, uh, that is the event of the visitation, and uh, the birth of John the Baptist. Uh, as is uh, characteristic, really, of all of Nadal, of the Nadal images uh, uh, and their, their producers, it offers a very complex machinery of images and texts, including, of course, the alphabetically marked legend items that identify the various vignettes, episodes, settings, and events that fill the picture space above. Uh, the pictorial scenes are complex, complexly diverse in scale, setting, and temporality, although this group uh, is more tightly inter interrelated in terms of uh, biblical narrative and follows a more legible pictorial uh, route, uh, um, really starting uh, from the Annunciation in the roundel at the top and circling around uh, uh, to finish with that um, rectangular um, uh, window uh, in the center. Uh, than many others in, in the, uh, in the uh, group of, image, of uh, biblical images. Even so, um, uh, the somewhat awkwardly joined architectural spaces that moves from the flat roof uh, at the left to the uh, partial barrel vaulted space uh, of, the, um, of the central scene, and uh, uh, juxtaposed multiple shaped image uh, frames reflect uh, that complex program and maybe the complex um, sequence of the origin of the images. We might find a counterpart um, in the, uh, perhaps in the uh, juxtaposed tile roof pavilion uh, in the center of the oil painted screen alongside the uh, arched portal in the Kangxi screen painting that uh, may convey uh, the, uh, the paintings, this paintings, the Chinese oil paintings, mixed, mixed, also mixed sources. In the visitation uh, image, the Annunciation uh, scene, which is in the uh, uh, roundel up above, in some ways is harder to account for, um, although, it, of course, it fits narratively as an antecedent or prefiguration and parallel to the, uh, the greeting between Mary and Elizabeth down below. It's the, the angel uh, and, and uh, the virgin up above. Uh, this circular frame for the Annunciation uh, seems not to represent uh, an oculus-like opening uh, through the walls of, as it, ha as it is, Zachary's house. Uh, as with the other uh, framed spaces that surround it, uh, doorways, arches, and, and uh, the, uh, the square window, it might be understood as a kind of, uh, perhaps as a kind of tondo-shaped painting or perhaps even a a visionary mirror or lens, though it seems uh, uh, rather to float in front of rather than be attached to the, to the cornice behind it, uh, if indeed it needed explanation for its viewers. It would uh, not uh, at any rate have been out of keeping with Jesuit self-consciousness and calculation about instruments of propagation, visual and otherwise. Uh, or with uh, mannerist uh, Northern European uh, awareness of, uh, of pictorial artifice, uh, for the image to have, uh, for this image, the uh, uh, Christian image, to have staged a, a kind of comparative contest of various image devices, formats, and platforms, uh, as they might be, perhaps mirrors or these kind of window pictures. Uh, and the uh, stage for the theatrical uh, encounter uh, below. There are some other uh, parallels between the, uh, the uh, Antwerp print and uh, the Chinese screen. Uh, the generally statuesque uh, treatment of the main figures uh, with uh, clinging robes, emphasizing the uh, volumes, uh, certainly of the four larger figures in the, in, the, in the Christian print, and a generally columnar solidity for the women in the screen and augmented in both cases by the strong uh, shading of the draperies and the cast shadows of their bodies. Uh, the screen figures are, of course, uh, much more placid and the entire scene quieter, in a way uh, uneventful. Uh, if we imagine uh, the windows and uh, arch frames in the screen as suitable container, as potentially suitable containers for narratives, of the type that we see in the Christian prints, 
it has, at, in, at any rate, uh, in this case, uh, those narratives have been foregone or removed or, or vanished, replaced by a relatively unmoving landscape, uh, unmoving in the, the physical sense, but not unmeaningful, uh, again, if it might be read as the site of a projected imaginary uh, of southern China. The actual uh, vanishing point uh, of the screen uh, is um, still higher, um, out of sight, uh, or at the top center of the pavilion, as it's been diagrammed by a, a Japanese scholar. Um, uh, in the Nadal uh, visitation print, the primary vanishing point coincides uh, with, I guess my drawing here is pretty invisible, but it coincides with the, the central uh, rectangular framed uh, image of uh, uh, Mary uh, riding uh, on, the, on the donkey on the way to Nazareth. And uh, just below that, uh, in the, let's see if I have this, in the only um, really unexplicit episode uh, among this very uh, richly depicted array of scenes in the Christian print, the, uh, and you can probably barely see it, but there's a capital F uh, just uh, in front of the pregnant uh, abdomen uh, of, uh, of Elizabeth that marks the hidden interior of her womb where the uh, unborn John the Baptist, according to the explanatory legend, uh, leaps uh, in, her, in her womb at the sound of Mary's voice. So uh, to, uh, to uh, conclude, uh, vanishing points uh, can encompass uh, sources of plenitude and power and equally, uh, in a more plain spoken way, pl places where things are hidden uh, and disappear, uh, where they're placed beyond sight uh, but uh, still uh, quite potent in various narratives and contexts. In yet another sense, uh, vanishing points might be conceived as uh, liminal zones of transition, um, where present reality blends into dreams of imaginary others or other places, uh, as in the uh, Chinese screen, or perhaps even where cultural distinctions, as uh, they might be drawn between northern and southern, uh, eastern and western, uh, begin to merge. And that's a region uh, that uh, Jim Cale has done so much to illuminate in his long uh, career. Thank you. Vanishing images of a sorry images of a vanishing culture without a vanishing point. Can you hear me okay? Uh, uh, first, I want to thank uh, Sophie and Pat for inviting me here. I'm incredibly honored. Uh, and I, sorry, Jim Cahill isn't here, but um, it, it's an honor to, I, I was never a, an official student of his, so it, it's really very much a special honor to be here uh, in, in his honor. Um, even though I wasn't an official student here at Berkeley, I think in many ways we are all students of Jim Cahill, and we've all learned so much from reading uh, all of his works, and I actually had a very special experience. I think it was 1982 or 1983, I was a student at the Central Academy of Art in Beijing, and Jim came for several months to study in Beijing, and he was staying at the academy. And he uh, one day agreed to go out for dinner 
with me so that we could discuss this type of art that I really was very puzzled by. And he sat through a, a very long dinner at the Peace Hotel and patiently discussed uh, Bapo with me. So I, I thought today I would, I would talk about Bapo, uh, which is a type of art that appeared in the mid 19th century. And I have to say that Richard and I did not talk beforehand about our titles, um, but I was thinking about uh, vanishing points and, and perspective painting, and then thinking about Bapo, and even though it doesn't have it doesn't make use of the vanishing point, but, but it's still in the background. There is, in a sense, a, a vanishing point there. Um, and the reason it doesn't need to think about the vanishing point is because Bapo paintings all happen on, on the surface, uh, which is why the other title of my uh, talk is surface tension. So um, let's let's think first about what is ba po. Uh, the name translates to mean eight brokens, and uh, this is one ba po painting um, by a man named Hua Ji Fu. Uh, this is just a detail of it, and and I want to read to you the inscription that he wrote on this painting, and it reads. It doesn't matter that they are broken bamboo slips or damaged pages. These horizontal and vertical pieces of paper, they are all remains from the destruction of the Qin Dynasty hegemon. But yet on each of these bits of papers, what we see is perfection. So the concept was he was thinking about um, the burning of all the books during the Qin Dynasty, and that these are just the remnants of what was left of that great wisdom and those great works. But be because all we have is these remnants, they are themselves wonderful, cherished objects. Uh, uh, there are other words for Ba Po. Uh, one of them is Duan Jian San Pen, which means broken bamboo slips and damaged sheets of paper. Uh, and another is Jin Hui Dui, which means piles of ashes of brocade. Uh, and, and these are different words that, that came about in different regions of China. Uh, ba Po existed in the north and in the south. We are still not exactly sure where it originated or who originated it, but it was in the 19th century that originated and spread uh, to many different places all over China uh, and also many different styles in the hands of many artists. This on the left is a work by a man named Yang Wei Quan who worked in Shanghai. Um, you can see it's a very different style than Hua Ji Fu who was working in the north. Uh, so, so what is Ba Po? These are paintings that depict, and when I say depict, they are actually paintings. They, they are not uh, collages. And they depict old paintings, seals, rubbings of bronzes, rubbings of calligraphy, and printed books. And sometimes you'll also see advertisements and letters, all different types of objects. Uh, and they are almost always broken uh, or burnt or torn or worm eaten, but in some manner damaged. And, and that reflects back to uh, the, the Qin Dynasty and, and the destruction of, of the books and knowledge at that time, and probably also a nostalgia that people during the 19th century were beginning to feel about their own vanishing culture with the uh, intrusion of European culture and just feeling like everything was in a demise in China. So the question, one of our questions is how did we get from landscape paintings like the one you see in uh, 16th century on the left to these Bapo paintings? Uh, and there are many different 
types of paintings in, in Chinese art history that we talk about. Uh, there was figure painting, bird and flower painting, other styles of bird and flower painting, landscape paintings, uh, bogu paintings, which are paintings of antiquities, uh, other types of bogu paintings that incorporate rubbings of actual objects. Uh, antiquities themselves, and then Ba Po paintings, and, and various people have written that Ba Po actually became another type of these paintings. It just has not been written about much in Chinese art history, and it basically faded away after the 1950s, though there are still a few people practicing it. Um, just to give you an example of, of one artist. This is a man named uh, Liu Ling Hung. Uh, he did this work in 1911, which you all know was a very important date in Chinese history. Uh, I'm not sure if he was Manchu or not. It's very interesting that he includes some Manchu writing in this piece. Uh, it's said that he um, came from Hebei province and at one point was asked to, uh, it says this in his, the gazetteer where, uh, from the town that he came from, that he was asked to do a painting for the court. Now, the Forbidden City, there's no records of any painting that he did, but um, anyway, that, that's Liu Ling Hung, and we'll return to this painting later on. This is just a detail from it. Uh, again, you can see these uh, are rubbings, uh, a lot of objects that are damaged, uh, and, and a lot of objects that are really about calligraphy. Sometimes when I think about Chinese painting or any kind of painting or any kind of art, I, I think of a tree uh, with roots and that there are many different aspects of a society or art history that uh, contribute to, a, and those are the roots coming up together, that contribute to a piece of art work, and then that artwork in itself uh, creates many other different types of artworks. And so I'll just kind of go through that in terms of Ba Po, if we put a piece of Ba Po here, the, <laughs> there are many different factors that contributed to Ba Po coming about, and then uh, many di different types of Ba Po art that, that came out of that. So um, one of the things that contributed to Ba Po painting were, was uh, interest in bronzes and a passion for ancient bronzes, uh, and then the interest in making rubbings of bronzes and collecting <coughs> bronzes. Um, also the interest in China in calligraphy, uh, the interest in making rubbings of calligraphy, interest in making copies of objects, and then also uh, another important factor that contributed to Bapo painting was a lot of destruction that was happening during the 19th century in China. And then lithography as well. Uh, I'm not going to be able to explain all these aspects, um, but I just want to also explain that there were many different styles of Bapo painting that came out of that. And in fact, one should probably turn this tree on its side because, you know, if you think about time, things start on the left and they move right. Though in China, traditionally, they would go the other way. But anyway. Uh, anyway, so here we are with our Bapo tree. And the aspect I wanted to talk to today uh, in honor of Jim Cahill is is perspective and, and vanishing points or lack of vanishing points. Uh, and this is a very important special painting. Uh, it's in the Qianlong Garden in, in the Forbidden City. Uh, it was done in the 18th century, probably about 1776 or so, um, and we'll be coming back to it. But it's an excellent example of what in China is called Tongjinghua, or, or Richard was calling Toshihua. Uh, but it very much makes use of European 
perspective and the vanishing point, um, which you can see here. Uh, and uh, Bapur painting, on the other hand, doesn't look into the distance. It just looks right onto the surface of the painting. Um, and the, the paper surface and just disregards any depth. Um, excuse my bad skills at, at PowerPoint, but what I was trying to say is that if you, if you look at a Chinese, traditional Chinese painting, um, you can actually say there is perspective and there is depth. Uh, there are paintings that are one imagines to be in the far distance, there are things that are closer to the front, and then there are things on the surface, such as the paintings and the seals um, that are very much seen on the surface. And I think one of the reasons um, Bapo came to be or could come to be in China is because there already had been an interest in the surface of the painting with calligraphy and seals. Um, so here we are with our Bapua painting just sitting on the surface and surface tension. Now uh, this act the same interest in the surface came about in Europe and uh, eventually America as well. Uh, in the 20th century, Kurt Schwitters in Germany was, and, and then he came to America as well, was one of the first people to really be interested in the surface and then continued on with the abstract expressionists and Jackson Pollock. Um, but let's go back to China for a moment and the calligraphy. Uh, and I just want to talk for a moment about Mi Fu. Um, and we all know who Mi Fu is, but um, Mi Fu apparently um, uh, had a collection of flower paintings by Liu Chang, a, a, an artist, an early artist. And in uh, one of his books, he talks about how he took all these flower paintings and he mounted them on a screen. Uh, and uh, gives you a little sense, of, there's a Song Dynasty screen from about the same time period. Uh, and I imagine that it was one of these flat screens that he was mounting his paintings on. And he also uh, wrote about how the wife of the Emperor Renzong, also from the Song Dynasty, collected herself a lot of paintings by Li Cheng, earlier painter, and she also pasted them onto a screen. So we know that um, in the Song Dynasty already, people were taking paintings, pasting them on the surface of a screen, which almost begins to look like Bapo. We also know from um, a Hanshan poem that uh, even in the ninth century, people were probably already pasting calligraphy onto screens. Um, and, and that was, um, uh, there's a reference there to sutras being pasted on the wall. This is an image from Dunhuang um, of Vimala Karti, and I unfortunately haven't seen it in person, but it looks like, if you look very closely, that there are uh, calligraphies that are pasted on the back wall of this, of the screen there. Um, and this is a Buddhist temple that I was in in Shanxi province where um, these aren't uh, papers that are pasted on the wall but they are images of calligraphy and paintings that are painted on the wall and it's possible that this tradition came out of that same ninth century tradition. Now uh, this is <laughs> Li Yu who was um, many different things. He was a dramatist, uh, he was an in innovator, and an interior decorator. This is an image of him sitting uh, at a desk that he invented. Um, but in uh, one of his small essays that he calls Screens and Scrolls, he writes, 10 years ago, 
If one were doing screens or scrolls of paintings or calligraphy, there were three formats, hanging scrolls, square sheets, and horizontal scrolls. But in the past few years, there have appeared assembled brocades, using large and small, long and short, and even small fragments. As long as they match, they can be used. They, um, they can be said to be quite variable and they are pasted on screens. As soon as this method came out, everyone was competing with one another. Wherever you looked, it was visible. With the turn of one's eyes, it began to feel old and hackneyed. It is not that this is like vertical scrolls, square sheets, or horizontal scrolls, but after a great amount of time, it no longer looks new and fresh. So, uh, here is a painting that's in the Nelson Atkins uh, illustration from Jinping Mei. And you can see the screens in the back look like they have paintings that have been pasted on them. And this is probably what, me, uh, what Li Yu was referring to. Um, this is a Coromandel screen. Uh, and if we flip it over, we see the same type of imagery. Um, there's just one of the panels, um, and you can see the details. And it turns out that these are very specific paintings, and people have talked about how this type of work was influenced by the great amount of woodblock printing that was coming out, illustrated books of paintings that were coming out, and then the screen makers could take advantage of of transferring these images onto their screens. Um, so here we have two multiple image, image uh, screens. Uh, this is an interesting work. This is a Japanese work, 16th century Muromachi, also very similar uh, arrangement, composition. This is a 19th century screen. Uh, these are all pasted on, uh, this is at the MFA, but again, very similar. Uh, and <coughs> details from that. So we start to see that there's a similarity between what was going on in the Bapua paintings and these earlier panels. This is uh, one of the 12 beauties from the Yongzheng period. And if you look in the background, you can see that there are images of paintings that have been pasted on the wall. There's a big question in my mind, were they intended to look like they were pasted on the wall or were they intended to look like they were painted on the wall? My sense is that they were probably intended to look like they were painted because um, the calligraphy on the leaf is a Mifu calligraphy, and even if that existed in the Forbidden City, I don't think somebody would have just pasted it up <laughs> on the wall. But anyway, so there we go. Um, so these are all related, and just to give you a sense of what was happening in the Forbidden City about that same time period, um, this is again inside the Chenlong Garden. It's in a building called Yang He Jingshu. And it became popular in the 17th and 18th century, not just to have hanging scrolls, but to also paste paintings and calligraphy directly onto the wall. Um, these types of works uh, in Beijing are called tielo. And you can see it, tia to paste law means you can just take them right down. Um, so this is uh, three pieces that are in the Forbidden City. Uh, this is also in the Qianlong Garden. This is Drenchen Jai, and you can see, uh, again, more tielo that were pasted on the walls there. Uh, this is another Tongjinghua, another perspective painting, again, in the Qianlong Garden. And you can see in the background depicted are, are three paintings. The central one is a hanging scroll. And it has this wonderful method of being hung. It was too tall for the ceiling, and so they would have had to bend it over. And then the two on the side are actually tailored that were pasted 
on the wall and again coming back to this other painting also in the Chenlong Garden. Uh, these, uh, the paintings here were pasted directly onto the wall. So we start to really get a sense of uh, things are happening in the 17th and 18th century of people taking pieces of paintings and calligraphy and pasting them together. Um, this is a work by a man named uh, Sun Ming Chou. And when I first started studying Ba Po painting, I talked to the people uh, in Liu Li Chang, in the art dealers uh, in Beijing. And they said to me, the most important Ba Po artist was Sun Ming Chiu. Nobody had ever seen a work by him, but they knew from texts that they had written that Sun Ming Chiu um, was one of the earliest painters. And, and this is a work, it's actually a um, series of, of four pieces that he did. But it's, in, and he uh, was born in 1823. And so his works in many ways seem very similar to the panels in the screens that we were looking at. But he's starting to bring in more broken aspects, more, more deteriorating objects. Uh, this is just a detail of one of his paintings. So you can see how uh, fine his work was. So this is a painting of a rubbing. It's not a rubbing itself, and then he, he painted the brocade mounting and then wrote calligraphy on the mounting and, and signed it. And actually it's quite wonderful because we can learn a lot about him because he talks about how he was working at Leo Li, at a um, shop in Leo Li Chang at that time period. Uh, he was an incredibly innovative man uh, in terms of composition. This is another work that he did kind of in the shape of a of a tile, also the shape of a, a coin, but it's all made up of his paintings of rubbings and paintings of paintings. Uh, and this is another work that he did as well. Uh, he wasn't the only one working in these long thin strips. Uh, this is another artist, and again on the right is a detail. Um, of his work, and this is yet another artist who was not working in a strip, but still the objects are not overlapping one another. Um, they're all separated, though they are still deteriorated, and there is mention already uh, in the text there of Duan Jian San Pian. Um, this is yet another artist who also worked uh, in this very clean composition, very ordered, regular state. Uh, his name is Wu Chun Kui. Unfortunately, I have not been able to find out any other information about him, but he was very interesting and very fine focused artist, um, probably lived in the Tianjin era. Uh, and these are just some details again of the paintings within his painting. Uh, again, this is painting of rubbings of coins. Um, and this is another work that he did, the same artist, uh, again, looking at first rather orderly, uh, again, extremely fine. This is a painting of a painting on silk, um, and this is a painting of calligraphy. And then we see in the center, he's actually painted a Ba Po painting where the objects are deteriorating. So the guy had a great sense of humor, but it also shows us that quite the, this assemblage started quite early on. Um, and this is a work by Ma Shao Xuan, who was a snuff bottle artist, uh, again, working in the 1890s uh, to the 1900s, uh, and already doing the depiction of objects that are falling apart. Uh, and this is a piece I learned about in the past year, um, which kind of <coughs> blows away all of my theories, but uh, <laughs> because it was done in 1837. Um, it was done by a man named Liu Zhou, who was a monk 
artist in the Hangzhou area. This is not a painting. These are all rubbings, and they are not cut out and pasted on each other. They are, um, he somehow thought about the rubbing and, um, in a very detailed manner before he started it so he could create the appearance of these pieces overlapping. Uh, it's, it's a remarkable piece, and somewhere he, he writes that it takes him over a year to do just one of these images. Uh, and it's really fun because you can see that uh, in addition to including all sorts of antique objects, he, he also included this uh, coin from Russia. And how it got to Hangzhou, I don't know. So um, I want to end at at this point, or just about here, um, to think about again, so what is the tie between the perspective paintings and, and the Ba Po? And really, one of the things is that they're about illusion. Uh, perspective paintings are, are about trying to create an illusion of depth. And again, the Bapo paintings, and, and in some sense, I, I do think that they came out of the perspective paintings with their interest in reality and, and illusion. Um, and they are all, all of these types of painting are about uh, fooling the eye, trompe l'oeil. So um, with that, I just want to thank you. In the lights on. <laughs> so, um, so thank you to our panelists for three very fascinating papers. Our discussant today is Pat Berger um, of the uh, History Art of Art Department at UC Berkeley. And I'm wondering, we have a lot of um, people sitting in the other room back there, and I'm wondering if you'd like to, while Pat is getting set up, if you'd like to come up and fill in some of the empty seats. And maybe our panelists could come sit in the front too. Yeah, yeah. Let's all sit at the table. Yeah. <laughs>